Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Now, today's episode is an interesting one on so many levels. Doctor training, public health messages, industry influence, chronic disease management versus addressing the cause. What a novel idea. Look, we've all visited doctors and we've had uh, various points in our lives and sometimes it's for an acute problem. You might have a respiratory infection, some injury or perhaps... You're in for a regular checkup. You might get some blood tests. The results come back. Your doctor gives you some advice. May even give you some medication. Now that that advice comes from years of studying at medical school. And then, if you can picture me now um, using quotation marks as I stay, say this, staying up to date with the latest and again in quotation marks, evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is the gold standard in healthcare. And of course, all of this is supported by professional organizations, one of which I'll get to in a moment. Now, as many of you may know, diabetes is a huge and growing problem in our society. Now, I'm going to reference here the Diabetes Australia website here, the National Diabetes Services Scheme. Surely you couldn't get more evidence-based and up-to-date than that, okay? So that was rhetorical, by the way. So what is type 1 diabetes? It's an autoimmune condition, the body attacking itself the pancreas literally stops making insulin. Now, that's in 15% of cases, that's what diabetes is, type 1. Much more commonly is type 2 diabetes. The pancreas does make insulin, but it's not produced in sufficient quantities for you, that your body needs and, and it doesn't work effectively. So um, it's a combination of genetics and environmental factors. It used to be called late-onset diabetes, but it's actually affecting people younger and younger. And this is still from the website, uh, Managing Type 2 Diabetes. I wanted to share this with you because it's very relevant to our conversation today. And I again quote Diabetes Australia here. Type 2 diabetes can often initially be managed with healthy eating and regular physical activity. However, over time, most people with type 2 diabetes will also need tablets and many will also need insulin. It's important to note that this is just the natural progression of the disease. I'm still quoting. And taking tablets or insulin as soon as they are required can result in fewer complications in the long term. To help you manage diabetes, your diabetes, and again, this is that National Diabetes Services Scheme from Diabetes Australia, here are your meal suggestions, regular and spread evenly throughout the day. Lower in fat, particularly saturated fat, and most importantly, should be based on high fiber carbohydrate foods such as whole grain breads, cereals, beans, lentils, vegetables, and fruits. Well, my guest today is Melbourne medical practitioner, Dr. Rob Zabo. And this is not a spoiler, but he runs the practice in Melbourne. His practice is called the Low Carb Clinic. I had the pleasure of meeting Rob when he was speaking at the annual conference of the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, the acronym is ACNEM, which has been training our medical and allied health practitioners in nutritional and environmental medicine since 1982. I happen to be the president of that college. We really enjoyed chatting when we met and his story and his interests in regenerative agriculture are so aligned with this show that I just had to have him on and share him with you. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Rob Zabo. Welcome to the show, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Rob, now, we met for the first time at the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine's annual conference uh, this May, and you gave a fantastic presentation, and I thought, i just got to get you on this show and talk to you about that again. So I, I wondered if you might share with us your own personal journey. And, I, and I, you're, you know, you're a med- medical practitioner from your training right through to where you are today. Sure, Ron. Uh, well, thanks very much for having me on. First of all, I've, I've had a look at the, the calibre of all the people that you get on. I'm quite flattered to be on. Um, yeah, as you say, I, I was really, really excited and I really enjoyed speaking at the conference uh, and um, was delighted. There was a really good reaction response to the to the talk. So, mm-hmm. um, And uh, as you say, I, I guess my journey to, to get to um, what I'm doing these days has been very personal and it's been a 
a health journey uh, for my for me, and um, it happened over the last seven years. Uh, so I'm 44 now, and back when I was 37, I, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and it was an enormous shock because, uh, for uh, ostensibly, I, I on paper, you know, shouldn't have shouldn't have got it. Uh, if you if you think about the sorts of things that we're told to do, you know, and that that was that was the big kick in the guts for me was that I felt like I had spent a lot of effort over many years trying to be healthy. What what, uh, what characterised that? What if you had to put it in a nutshell? Just to remind our listener of what you know that was, um, tell us a bit about that. What so is the, what was being healthy? Yeah, so the health related behaviours that I regularly engaged in were that I, I went and I exercised at the gym six days a week, and um, I and that included um, as well as that I'd walk my dogs most days. So you know I'd have some um, some cardio, but I'd also lift some weights. Um, you know, virtually every day of the week. Uh, for about an hour each day, uh, I would um, make sure that I had lots of um, whole grain cereals. I'd I'd always, you know, have whole oats and um, brown rice, and uh, I'd have lots of vegetables, lots of greens, lots of broccoli, and lots of lean meats. Um, not too much uh, red meat. I'd have lots of uh, chicken and fish, uh, quite lean, and. Uh, the thing is, I, I'd um, you know, I I would always also have a, have a cheat day, as many of us um, do, and that would be quite sugary. And I had a terrible sweet tooth, and I'd been raised on sugar. My, my mum, bless her, um, loved us and loves loves us, and and she showed her love with sugar. And as, of, as many as many people do. That's right. I had lots of lots of sweet treats for us throughout our childhood. And that had kind of, you know, that habit had carried through into my adulthood as well. And so um, in retrospect, you know, when I reflect on where that diagnosis came from, it, it was obvious. But for me at the time, you know, it was an absolute mystery. And I, I, I was spellbound as to how this could have happened in the context of all the things I was doing to try and look after myself. What were some of the symptoms that uh, that you, you know, you must have, I mean, were you regularly taking your blood sugar or, or was this just oh, part of an annual check? I had no symptoms. I felt great. <laughs> right. I had a HBA, HBA1C of 7.7. 7, right. right. What's, a, what's a healthy range to remind our listener because they may right. not have. So, so normal is uh, HbA1C is a marker of long-term glucose kind of control and mm -hmm. no, normal is less than 5.6. Mm -hmm. um, Pre-diabetes is 5.6 to 6.4 and diabetes is over 6.5. Wow. So um, given that it's a very, very steady reading, it doesn't vary day to day, week to week. It varies more over months. Um, at 7.7, .7, I was very diabetic. I wasn't a little bit diabetic. Mm. I was great. I was going to, my, going to the gym. I was doing all my exercises, and I was really, I, I thought, thriving. <laughs> so mm. <laughs> it, was, it was an insurance medical that I was just doing for income protection insurance. Right. And so, you know, um, at first I just, I was in denial, and I thought, that's not my blood. That's somebody else's. Of course, of course, yeah. I'm quite understandable. <laughs> right. So, so I went to my own GP and, and organised some testing and unfortunately, sure enough, it was my blood. Mm. Uh, yeah, so so here you were, I mean, you'd already been in medical practice, what, 10, 15 years? Uh, I graduated, graduated in 99. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a, yeah, yeah. a good 15 years or so. Yeah. And and you were doing pretty much everything. I mean, you you went to. I, I know you mentioned to me you you studied at Monash University in in Melbourne, and and I know some of the people there, and and I know it to be quite a progressive um, mm. medical school. So you would you you'd been through the system, you'd been in general practice, you were doing everything you were supposed to do. You were feeling mm. terrific, <laughs> which is right. even more bizarre. Exactly. I was I was following the the healthy paradigm. Yeah. But but you were feeling good, which is even more bizarre, know. you know. And here you were at thirty seven, right. doing everything right. Yeah, go on, yeah. go on. What happened then? And you know, sure, sure, I had a bit of a layer. You know, I probably, you know, I, I, I I'm one hundred and eighty centimeters, and I I weighed maybe ninety to ninety five kilograms, and some of that was muscle. But you know, I, I was probably I'm like by comparison now, I'm still working out, but I'm I'm about eighty. 384 kilograms now so you know maybe mm -hmm. 10 10 to 12 kilograms more um which would have been fat um but i wasn't obese i, w I was in the overweight range i probably had a bmi about 27 or 28 
Um, yeah, so um, that was that state. And, you know, the what happened then was that I, I was sent to an endocrinologist to try and determine was this maybe larder or, you know, the form of type 1 diabetes, given that I wasn't that overweight and I was fairly young for the diagnosis. And she determines that, no, it was, in fact, type 2 diabetes. And um, she then promptly sent me, sent me on to a well-regarded dietitian. Um, and the dietitian went through my diet and said, hey, look, you're eating perfectly. Really, there's n- nothing more. Look, I, not quite. She said maybe add a bit more dairy, maybe have a bit more yogurt and cheese. Um, but but low apart- fat? Was she was she keen that you sure. stay on low for fat? Sure. For sure. Mm. But but apart from that, really, she really couldn't fault. You know, I wasn't eating biscuits. I wasn't eating ice creams. You know, maybe just for that one day of the week, you know, but the rest of the time I wasn't doing any of the sorts of things that we're told not to do. Mm. Um, so I was absolutely baffled as to why I was where I was. Um, but you know, and you know, I think with a when when that was the, the the direction that I'd been coming from, I felt like a, you know, and and knowing that this is a lifestyle disease, I just somehow felt like a bad person, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> terrible sense of guilt that I'd done something wrong, but I couldn't quite figure out what that thing was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was really really baffled. But you know, at the same time, I'd always said to to my friends and family, you know, the going through medical school, the one disease I really really don't ever want to get is diabetes. Mm. Yeah. Because, because as you and I know, this is not one diagnosis. This is a thousand diagnoses once you have diabetes because of all the things that it causes. And, and just, so, just, just remind our listener why diabetes is such a, a problem. I mean, I, I know, but, but and I'm sure a lot yeah, of my listeners well, do, but let's remind our listener why diabetes is such an issue. Well, the thing is, it, the, it's really the, the, the stuff that goes on in, in your body when you've got diabetes or even – the earlier stages, even pre-diabetes or even insulin resistance with a normal blood glucose, in which case you're not going to be diagnosed necessarily with anything, but you're going to still have this condition that is the is the the, the um, early you know pre um, the precondition of diabetes is that that's the thing the insulin resistance is the thing that actually causes all of well most of the, the diseases that we're experiencing, whether it's something as simple as high blood pressure or whether it's something as you know devastating as a heart attack or a cancer diagnosis. Um, so we know that the people that have diabetes have something like a, a, a 300% or you know a triple um, rate of cancer compared to people that don't have diabetes. Mm. Um, and then, it, then, it, then there's all the other specific things that um, – that happen in diabetes, like the the blindness and the kidney failure and the you know ulcers and leg amputations and all those fun things, but all of those specific things aside, you know there's all this other stuff that happens when when you have diabetes. So once you have diabetes, um, you, you kind of can look forward to lots of doctor trips, lots of events, and by events I mean not not fun events, <laughs> but actually <laughs> medical diagnoses on top of your diabetes diagnosis. And I, so I, I kind of just, you know, threw my head between my legs and I just thought, my God, my life has changed. Mm, mm. Uh, so it was really quite quite an awful experience, to be honest. Mm. And, and I, I kept it to myself because I you know, felt ashamed that I'd done something wrong and had this kind of lifestyle disease. But, but it's, at the same time, I thought, well, I really don't know what I've done wrong. <laughs> quite baffling. And, 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 of course, you had been in practice and you will have seen – Many patients with uh, diabetes, pre-diabetes, and and you will have advised them according to everything that you'd learnt. And here you were at the dietitian right. and the endocrinologist. What is the what what is the typical advice that a person diagnosed with type two diabetes would get from you pre your diagnosis? Uh, so, um, well, I, I'd I'd um, put them on medications. That would be one of the first things that I'd think to do, and I think most doctors, most GPs are in that, you know, mindset. We we we're medically our education, and as you say, I had a I thought I had a great education, and you know, much of it was still it was was fantastic. A lot of great educators at Monash, um, but the, but the medical paradigm really is is very drug company you know driven, and you know, just all you need to do is find out just how many visits are average doctor gets from the local drug rep to to know that that's really true um so that's the first thing you think of is your, is your prescription pad um r- rightly or wrongly r- you know wrongly obviously but um and then, and then you know get rid of sugar and but we're really not really we're really not taught, taught about the impact of starches 
you know, everyone's talking about sugar, which is a very, very important discussion to have, but no one's really talking about starch. And that is the, the big elephant in the room. Mm. Mm. Uh, you know, whether it's the oats in the morning or whether it's the, the potatoes and the rice and the bread and the pasta, um, you know, all, all you need to do if, if um, you know, for somebody, even if you haven't got diabetes, actually, is if, you, if you've got somebody who's got a blood glucose monitor, is have a really big starchy meal, big bowl of pasta with some garlic bread and, you know, followed by um, an apple and a, a low-fat yogurt and check your blood sugar half an hour, one hour. It'll go up to 10. It'll mm. go up into the diabetic range. Now, if you're not diabetic, then it'll come back down again after a, an hour or two, but it will still spend some time up in that zone, and that's a toxic zone for the body. Mm. Um, if you're diabetic, it will stay there, and it'll continue to you know, um, ravage the, the, the effect of that toxic high blood sugar. Yeah. Uh, now, now I, know, I know we're going to be talking about, about your approach but i'm i'm back to your story because here you are at 37 here you are at an endocrinologist here you are you know with your medical background and mm. and facing a lifetime of medication some mm. some you know i think metformin's a pretty common one isn't it or or that's is right, that's right, that's yeah, right. metformin that's, that's what my gp put me on yeah. uh, uh, but then then something happened uh, you know, to you, or you, you had another think about it. Tell, share yeah, with our yeah. listener that that uh, that epiphany. Well, right. and and I think, you know, I think for the sort of people that go to an acronym conference or that get involved in this, I think this is a really common experience: is having a personal shock that that gets us there. Uh, mm. And it's unfortunate that, that that's often what it takes. You know, we 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 kind of have this sort of thing where something happens to us in our lives that really makes us question so much of what we assumed. And then we think, well, if that was wrong, what else might be wrong? Let's explore this more deeply. Um, but um, for me, I was very lucky to have a, have a friend um, who's a, a physiotherapist near where I work, um, who uh, Andrew Wine, who, who um, said to me he'd been to a low-carb down under conference run um, uh Run by a local anaesthetist. Um, yes, we've had we've had Rod 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 Taylor's been a guest on our program. Yeah, he's yeah, fantastic. He's, he's done some yeah. amazing work. He has. Yeah, and and uh, so Andrew had been to one of these conferences where Tim Noakes had spoken, who was his hero, and you know Tim Tim's a professor of sports medicine from South Africa, who's known worldwide for his um, sort of his also um, journey in turning to a low carb diet. And, and he, Andrew had said to me that these people were almost like a cult. <laughs> so look, he, you know, they were so f fervent and there was this energy in the room because they're talking about how they can reverse diabetes. And I hadn't told Andrew about my diagnosis, you know, and um, I kind of just went all, you know, quiet and thought, right, I need to look this up in my own time and went home and looked it all up and it kind of made sense that if you don't eat this starch, you're not going to be spiking your blood glucose and you might actually end up having normal blood glucose levels. So um, I went home and tried that, and I was on metformin at the time, and so I thought, right, well, I'm just going to stop the metformin and stop eating carbohydrates and check my blood glucose levels closely. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, they were essentially normal. Wow. Within, with how long did this normality take to kick in? Um, instantly. So just one day, I just in the morning, I just didn't take my metformin, and I didn't eat my oats. And I had instead some eggs. And throughout that morning and afternoon, they were all normal. My God. I mean, I can only imagine how, well, you must have been pretty excited about that. Well, I was. Well, <laughs> That's you know, pretty mildly. Yeah, exactly. And especially what I'd, what, what I'd sort of, I'd watched a few YouTube lectures and I'd read some stuff online and I'd, you know, the, to be able to reverse this disease, which I thought was a life sentence, which is, which is the paradigm through which we're taught. You know, any, any doctor will tell you that that's really the, the paradigm, you know, it's it's that this is a lifelong sentence. Um, so to, to have read that maybe you can actually unwind this was really exciting. Mm. Yes, particularly as it's happening to you. Right, right. right. You know, I mean, you get like, excited enough if you manage to do that for a patient. I think that's exactly. pretty exciting yeah. at the best of yep. times. But when you're the patient, it so takes it's on another like a, form. Right, right. And it's kind of like a paroxysm of, of um, you know, it's a, it's a really profound thing to, to happen because – 
so many, you know, long held assumptions suddenly sort of, you know, come crumbling down. And as, as, as the weeks went on and I, you know, this, these blood glucose as being normal just continued, then, um, I started to think, you know, what, why aren't we doing this? Why, why isn't everyone doing this? This is just so simple. And mm. I found it very easy to do. Like I, I didn't find it difficult to give these things up. And um, some people do. And, um, I've treated many patients this way since, and some people do. And that's understandable when it's ubiquitous. You know, carbohydrates are basically everywhere and mm. in every meal almost. But for, for me and for a lot of my other patients, it's very simple. Yeah. So – yeah. Um, but, but what you asked a very important question there because it is remarkably logical and remarkably simple yeah. and remarkably profound. Mm-hmm. And the question is why? Why isn't it? Why, why, what did you come up with? You, you've grappled with this question. And I don't want you to put your head on the chopping block here too far, Rob. But because I know you're. Why? Yeah, why? Yeah. And, and, you know, that when you put it like that, and I'd put it that way in my mind many times, and it's really embarrassing that I didn't figure this out for myself. Mm. <laughs> like, well, you know, these things are made of glucose, and you've got a disease where you can't control your glucose, and why the hell would you eat it? You know, especially when a high glucose is toxic, and it's the actual thing that does you all the damage in diabetes. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like, you know, adding up one and one. Yeah. So um, why? Why aren't we taught this really simple but profound lesson? Um Hey, you know, there's there's a multitude of reasons. Um, look, I, I mean, I hate to say, but at the moment, maintaining the status quo, and it's always easy to maintain the status quo. You know, we're we're, we're change resistant as, as as humans, and I guess you know that comes back from our our um, ancestors, where they had to live in this you know dangerous and difficult to survive in world, where you would get wisdom from your ancestors to be able to survive. So that desire to change, I think, is very that resistance is very built into us. Mm. So Whenever you've got a paradigm that's in, in place, uh, you know, not just within, you know, the doctor's, doctor's consultation room, but but globally and internationally, and well, it's very easy to maintain that. So, you know, where we find ourselves now is is just so simple to for that those powers to be to maintain. Mm-hmm. And and the reality is, like I said, that there's this is a probably trillions of dollars invested in in maintaining the status quo. Because we're talking not just about all of the drugs that go with not just diabetes management, but all of the consequences, like I was saying, of diabetes um, related diseases, but also all of the food that is being sold. Because I mean, I often think about all the fat on all the people's bodies around the world, just like it was on mine um, seven years ago, as being food industry profit. You know, this this is this is yeah. food that humans your calories that humans. Eight because they were made to be more hungry than they ought to have been because of the food that they were eating, you know. So, mm. you know, so all these starches and sugars that they were eating was were actually playing with the hunger and satiety signaling to make these people more hungry. And so this this is food that they really didn't need to eat, but you know the food industry has made a profit from those sales. Mm. Um, so if you add in all the food and all of the drugs and all of the complications from diabetes, this is going to be trillions of dollars. Mm, mm. It's a great economic model, isn't it? <laughs> Look, it's amazing. You know, it's a great it's, business model. I mean, you know, if you were going to write a business plan for anything, oh, yeah. the health industry, that's a, that's a beauty, isn't it? Right, right. You've got not only the cause is making a profit, the food, but the effect, you know, the um, – the drugs and all of the complications that are making a profit. So, and unfortunately, I've sort of come to the realization that the health industry is mostly about industry and not so much about health. And, you know, I hate to, I really hate to say that because it's um, a little bit, um, you potentially can be demoralizing. But um, I guess what I do to um, overcome that is to think, well, you know, I can do my little bit. Yeah. And it is little, but it's still something. Um, and that's what I do with my patients is to, is to give them the option of um, unraveling themselves from this, this whole sort of system. Well, it's profoundly, I know because I've heard you speak, and it's profoundly affected your practice. In fact, your practice in Melbourne is now is called the Low Carb Clinic. Is, that's right, yeah. isn't it? And, but I'm just intrigued. You, you know, this went through, you, 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 you turned this around in 24 hours. In, you know, in a, in a week, you were, you were a changed person. Um, how, how do you then go back into the practice on, on Monday 
after having normalised your own blood, uh, you know, wow. I mean, just can only... And the first patient, I'll bet you that first patient was a diabetes patient or yeah. pre-diabetic, and here you were, born again. I know. Yeah. Uh, you know I can only imagine. People, you know what we think of people who are born again? You know, we kind of raise our eyebrows. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, hang on. Here we go. <laughs> and, and so this is the thing, you know, I think that the doctors that I practice with in my other place in the general practice and that I... Because I'm in two places. I'm in my low carb clinic that I work, but I'm also in a general practice a few days a week. Mm. Um, I think I, I've had to be very careful to not come across as being too evangelical at the same time as maintaining my passion. And that's a fine line to, to walk. Um, in fact, one of the one of my um, closer doctors that I work with is, is a friend uh, actually called me evangelical recently. God, what <laughs> you can't get much worse than that. Well, that's what I thought at first. You know, at first I was gutted. Yeah. I, I try so hard to not be a Yeah, yeah that, I think this is a noble thing, Rob. Let's, but, let's, not, let's but, not stifle but, things here. But then I, then I came to own it. Mm. And I thought, you know, if this is um, a comment, commentary on, on how, I, how, how much passion I bring to what I do, you, you know, I, I, I wear that with pride. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, I, I, I still, I think that ultimately – as we're taught in medical school right the way through, the important thing is patient choice. Mm. This is not about us. This is about our patients. And um, I have many patients who, to whom I talk about the option of reversing their diabetes using a low-carbohydrate approach, and they're not interested. And that's absolutely fine. You know, I, I support that for them because uh, – they have their own set of life circumstances and they're the ones that are best placed to know what's right and what's not for them. Um, and I've had other people for whom it hasn't been right for years and then it suddenly become right. Mm -hmm. And they don't go back. You know, I think once you, this is the thing, you know, for somebody like myself and for somebody like one of those patients, once you see something, you can't unsee it. <laughs> and, and, you know, you have that, that, eye-opening moment that, you know, is going to carry with you for the rest of your life. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it, because you, you mentioned your mother feeding you all sorts of – and our, all our all our mums or whatever did, mm. and it was always associated with celebrations and, and this and that. So yeah. you can really – I mean, it's a bit like religion sometimes or politics as well, and going to somebody's uh, diet is sometimes digging into a part, a part of their existence that they really – don't want to go. You're right, and, yeah. I, and I think that's that's fine. I think that, but it's so important to be given the knowledge and then make your own decision. And that's the thing that I'm most disappointed about is that people are not given this option and, and this this information when they're first diagnosed. And my my real hope is that one day that changes so that um, that the doctors are well armed with this knowledge and can say, well, hang, hang on, you've actually got some options. You don't necessarily need to go down the path of this getting worse and worse and worse. And that's the other thing I forgot to mention with diabetes that really gutted me is that I, you know, have been taught that it was a progressive condition. And by progressive, what that means is it's a bit like having a cancer. And so it, this is, it was kind of like the, the cancer model of, of diabetes is what we're taught, which is you've got a diagnosis, you're going to have it for life. It's going to get worse. Um, you're going to get complications from it. It just depends on whether they're sooner rather than later or, you know, um, mm. and eventually it most likely will kill you um, because of the complications. So that's a bit like having a cancer, right? When you think about it, it's like the palliative care model of, of diabetes where it's a lifelong condition, it gets worse, it needs more chemotherapy, i.e. medications, as, as it gets worse, and then it eventually kills you. Mm -hmm. It's like it's gone into a holding pattern before before you die that's awful yeah yeah and, and instead we're given the other we're not given the other option to to reverse the disease it's a bit like you know having a cancer where you have a, a potential for cure but not being offered it mm. one of the things that's always intrigued me and, and i like the low carb rob rob rod uh, taylor's low carb um, group and and now you will have noticed at the ACNEM conference uh, in in uh, May this year there was very much a an emphasis on on this approach, yeah. and and we heard it from many different people. We heard it from pediatric gastroenterologists. We heard it from obstetricians. We heard it from anaesthetists. We heard it from urologists. We heard it from you, 
We heard it mm. from the sports medicine uh, guru, Peter Bruckner, as well. Yeah. Um, you know, the thing that, that – uh, so it is happening. Cancer is an interesting one. Always intrigued me that, uh, you know, the use of a PET scan – involves the, uh, if I'm correct here, involves the injection of a radioactive glucose because mm. it's known that cancer cells preferentially like glucose. And so you, if you lie still so that your muscles don't get that glucose for 10 or 15 minutes and then you take a PET scan, the cancer cells will light up. Is that right? Is that what a PET scan is? I've got a pretty rudimentary knowledge as well, so you have to excuse yeah, me. I think, I think that is, but having had... Having had cancer and explored it myself, uh, yeah. I do know that that's the case. And so, you know, you'd think, okay, we're using radioactive glucose diagnostically. Right. Let's go to the Cancer Council website and let's get some recipes. And yeah. when I went there, it was it, it similarly hadn't made that leap into, yeah. you know, hey, maybe glucose in all its forms is, is a bit of a problem. Yeah. But when you let's get back now to what what low carb is because you are in the low carb clinic and low carb by no means different things to different people. Um, what does low carb mean? Uh, so for me, and I guess for um, what I what I like to talk to my patients about is if if they, they choose to go down that path is is to really switch uh, energy supply systems. So it's a fundamental change in how the body operates, and that is. That um, is based on the fact that we're a hybrid engine. You know, our bodies really can run on different fuels. Uh, it's a bit like an electric car that can run on, you know, petrol and electricity. Uh, and what we're doing is switching from one fuel, i.e. carbohydrates, to another fuel, i.e. fat. And so fat becomes our predominant fuel source. Uh, and and the beautiful thing about that is that it, it keeps glucose nice and low. So as you say, if you've got a glucose-dependent cancer or if you've got a inability to control your blood glucose, i.e. diabetes, then that's not even a consideration because you're not feeding yourself the glucose. Now, I mean, it is in some people who are more severely diabetic and, you know, had it for much longer or in type 1 diabetics where they don't make any insulin whatsoever. So they still need, you know, to inject their insulin. But even for those people, a low-carbohydrate diet is just vastly superior when it comes to managing their type 1 diabetes. They will have less inject need for injection. A much much lower insulin dose, and as a result, a much much lower fluctuation. Because what really leads to the huge swings and roundabouts in type one diabetes is the scale of injection. So it's it's um, to quote Richard Bernstein, who's written um, uh, the Diabetes Solution book, which is like the bible of type one diabetic low carb management. Um, it's the rule of small numbers. Um, and the rule of small numbers is that um, the smaller the insulin dose, or first of all, the smaller the carbohydrate intake, the smaller the insulin dose, the smaller the fluctuations. Um, because the thing with insulin in type 1 diabetes, it's a very blunt tool and it's very imperfect. And there's no way around that. We're stuck with that imper imperfection. So that, um, you know, the, the more insulin you have, the greater the highs and lows that you're going to get because of the inaccuracies, inaccuracies of dosing. So basically this rule of small numbers is the smaller all of those things are, the tighter your control. And the more you can take your, um, your target lower. So that what actually prevents somebody who's on a high carbohydrate diet with type 1 from getting really tight diabetic control are the hypos. When you go low with your blood sugar, that can kill you. You know, that, that can be a fatal event. And so you can't actually afford to get any tighter when your band of error is so great. You know, your highs and lows are so high and so low that you need to kind of keep your average quite high. But when you have such a small injection of insulin, then you can you really tighten up that, 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 um, that, that, that window. And so you can really afford to tighten it right up because you're not going to get the high pose. Mm -hmm. And so you can... You can essentially get normal blood glucose levels, I mean non-diabetic blood glucose levels um, on a low-carbohydrate diet with your insulin dosing in, in type 1 diabetes. You know, you've you still got diabetes, you've still got to inject your insulin. Um, it's usually about maybe a third to a half of what you would have been injecting beforehand. 
but you basically have non-diabetic blood glucose levels. And when you've got that, then you don't need to worry about all those fun things that I spoke to you. Know, mm-hmm. to you. <laughs> you know, I love you. I love your analogy of uh, the hybrid car uh, because uh, having driven and drive a hybrid car, I know that I'm not always in electric mode and I'm not always in petrol mode, but as I drive along, I fluctuate. Is yeah. that is that what we can do as humans? Like yeah. within a 24-hour period, there are times when we're in... Precisely. Yeah. So we don't have to be in... Well, there's another word we're hearing a lot about, which is ketosis. Yeah. Just remind our listener about keto- what, what, what that is. Yeah, so so ketosis is a, as you say, we're hearing a lot about it, and 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 quite rightly, it, it's it's been found to have not only not only be a state of utilizing fat as the main fuel source, but also to be a, a really powerful metabolic state for our body to be in for a whole range of um, health and um, disease benefiting you know processes. So um, it, ketosis is. Basically, just means that fat is the predominant fuel. It's not the only fuel, but it's the predominant fuel that we're utilizing in our body. And as you rightly point out, there will be times, even in someone who's got who's in ketosis, in ketosis, when they will be utilizing glucose. That will always be happening in the background at low levels, um, but uh, fat will predominate. And when that happens, when the body's tuned to burning fat predominantly, then um, you really induce a whole lot of enzymes that upregulate that process um, and they upregulate the ability to use fat as a fuel. So those enzymes, once they're induced, your body is kind of just humming along on fat. And the beauty of that is that we have an enormous energy reserve of fat in even a lean person's got, you know, apparently something like, you know, 40 or 50,000 calories in fat Mm. on their bodies. You know, that's a lean person, let alone, you know, someone who's obese might have several hundred thousand calories in fat, mm-hmm. on the body. like what an, an amazing energy reserve, you know. When, when you consider that the average person has like two to three thousand calories per day, yeah. you know, if you've got a couple of hundred thousand, you're not going to run out of energy anytime soon. But you know, if you can tap into that, wow, you know, your hunger is suppressed and your energy levels are boosted because you suddenly have this constant supply of energy. Really so, so, so we've got these two fuel sources, which is great, and I, I love this uh, analogy. So, again, what, what uh, I mean, when I read some, and you will have read these too, the journals which talk about, well, low-carb doesn't make much difference, and then you read the, uh, the fine print and they're talking about 250 grams of carbohydrate mm-hmm. a day, which is low because sometimes the recommended dose is 350 to 400 grams right. of carb a day. So 250 or even 150 is low, but that's not really low, is it? What, what is low? No, I don't think so. I think so. What, for what, me, what, low, putting a number on it or numbers. Yeah, for me, low is, is definitely less than 50 grams, but preferably for most people, less than 30 grams total carbohydrate per day. And when you think about one banana has about 30 grams, then you can kind of see what I'm talking about. You know, it really, fruit becomes a very, very, you know, scarce part of the diet. Like it's, you know, basically I prefer that people don't have fruit because of the amount of sugar that it, you know, one one banana's got six six teaspoons of sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we would never put six teaspoons of sugar into our coffee or tea, you know, but um, that's what we eat every time we have a banana. Um, so yeah, it's really, really low. So basically all of the starches and all of the sugars are sort of out of the diet, which sounds maybe to some people who are not familiar with it really awful, you know, think, wow, you know, how am I going to enjoy my food? Yeah. <laughs> but, what can I eat? Yeah. There's lots of really, in fact, there's lots and lots of winners, you know, there, there may be some losers. That's true. And, um, but the thing is there's many, many winners. And I found myself having this reflection many times over the first few months when I started embarking on this, you know, some, this is six years ago when I started doing this. And I remember thinking, oh, you know, I can't have my bowl of oats in the morning. I really enjoyed that. (laughs) Um, But then I'd think, well, hang on, you know, I can have eggs and bacon. That's not bad. It's Mm -hmm. pretty good, Mm -hmm. you know, and I can have roast chicken. That's pretty good. I can have cheese. That's pretty good. Mm. I can have nuts. So uh, there are many, many winners yeah. Um, and, and for me now, I mean, this is, this is what happens, I think, to most people just through talking to my patients, that after a few months of not eating these foods, they kind of become non-foods. 
yeah. you, you just you don't miss them anymore, and they they're kind of like like you would think of you know no, you know a stick or some dirt. You just don't even consider it to be edible. You know, <laughs> it's mm. it's and I, I actually think that these things are not really human grade. You know, for <laughs> for most people, no, no, because... you're talking about the foundation of the food pyramid here, right? Um, so be careful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's all right. You're in good company here, but, but Rod. No, no, yeah, I think he is a very valid point. I understand how people can feel like you know they might be listening to this and just be completely put off by what I'm saying and think mm. it's ridiculous. Uh, I respect that, you know, and I I probably would have felt the same way years ago. So I, I completely understand, um, but. The reality is that there's only 10 to 15% of the population that can handle these things well. And why I say that is, so for those people, um, they're probably fine, right? So it's, mm. it's not a one-size-fits-all model. It's, it's very individual. And, you know, if you're lean and you eat lots of complex carbohydrates and if you keep your sugar low – you might be able to get away with it. It doesn't mean it's probably the best thing for you. I don't think it still is, but you can probably get away with it. Mm. Now, the reason I say only 10 to 15% is that we have the data which I presented in my talk is that 52% of the US adult population, um, which is probably very similar in Australia, maybe slightly slightly less, but probably not very different. Um, so 52% of the adult population um, were either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Yeah. And there's other data that if you then add to that, um, tell us that there's people, it's probably another, you know, 30 to 40% of the population that have a normal glucose, you know, who um, are still insulin resistant, but are still ma managing their glucose at a normal level. So they're sort of pre-pre-diabetic, if you like. Mm -hmm. So when you add that 52% of pre-diabetics and diabetics onto the extra 30 to 40% that are insulin resistant, that brings us up to 85 to 90% of the population, mm -hmm. which only leaves us 10 to 15% that are actually not insulin resistant. And it's the insulin resistance that actually does a lot of the damage, a lot of the heart attack risk and a lot of the cancer risk is actually in that insulin resistance. So it's not even the abnormal glucose that leads to a lot of the diseases that diabetes leads to. It's actually the insulin resistance in diabetes that leads to those diseases. And the marker for insulin resistance is this HB1C? Is that, am I, what are the, what are the markers there? So this is the thing, it's, it's difficult. It answers no, unfortunately, if only it was that easy. HB1C will only start to become abnormal once you're pre-diabetic or diabetic. So it's only if you're in that 52% of the adult population that you'll start to get. And unfortunately, the, the knowledge that I've, I've discovered before, and, and, and well, this is also thinking about me pre-diagnosis, my own diagnosis, was that we're not taught how to interpret HbA1c normally. So I see a lot of patients, i am lost count of how many patients have been not been told by their doctor that they're either pre-diabetic or diabetic, that have got a HbA1c of 6.0 or 6.5 or whatever, I think, you know, we're, we've been trained to think that a, a good HbA1c is in the sevens. Wow. Or say, you know, high sixes to low sevens yeah. is, is good. That's what we're taught. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of doctors um, will, um, will think that something in the sixes, low sixes is fine, not, not even worth and, 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 you know, like, uh, do you think testing one, I always think when you move on to this low carb thing, you, mm. you actually need to spend a week or two or maybe longer, but not your whole life, a couple of weeks weighing and measuring and looking at the food. It's a really interesting experience mm. to mm. start to see, like you mentioned a banana uh, mm. having six teaspoons of sugar, you know, well, it's quite an eye opener. What about testing our blood glucose? Do you think that's a worthy exercise for a week or two of your life? Oh, definitely for a diabetic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, but yeah, for any of us that were in saying, like you didn't even know you were, and and, yeah. and I presume you weren't testing your blood, taking no. a finger prick test uh, on a yeah. daily basis. Well, I think well, I wonder whether ever, you know we should go through a little bit of a week long journey individually blood just glucose week. Yeah, yeah. Blood glucose week. I like that idea. Yeah. What is it what what is a normal like if what if I had something to eat and yeah. I did that, what would be a good result? Well it should stay in the fives or the fours. Right. 
you know, it shouldn't it shouldn't really go into the into the sixes or you know even if, if it is in the low sixes, but it shouldn't go into the high sixes or, or sevens. I mean, not that you know it, you're not going to get much damage to your body unless it's in the you know from seven point five and above. You know, the amount of damage you're going to get from that is going to be pretty minimal. You know, before you know lower than that. But mm. um, uh, and you know, I was talking about the fifty-two percent of the population that that were found to be the U.S. population that were found to be pre-diabetic or diabetic. The vast majority of those wouldn't know. Yeah. So you're right. You know, there's not half of the adult population that walk around knowing that they're pre-diabetic or diabetic. So um, this exercise would would suddenly you know cast a light on all of these. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but if I could just um, cover the other point that you mentioned, which is how do you measure insulin resistance? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that, as you say, you know, this is actually the the bulk of the population, and and this is a test that I think should be on every GP's kind of um, uh, just you know rubber stamp that we do for annual blood tests when we check things for people is a fasting insulin. Mm-hmm. It's not perfect, but then no test is. Yeah, um, but it, the number of times that it yields a really eye opening result. And you can say to somebody, you have a perfectly normal glucose, you're not pre-diabetic or diabetic, but there is a problem. Um, the number of times that you can have that conversation where it does reveal something is powerful because suddenly this person knows that they have a disease, they have a, a hormone disease, uh, and their insulin's too high. And that's what's causing them to have their high blood pressure or their um, obesity or their gout, or their polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, it might even be the cause of their osteoarthritis, uh, or their asthma, or their hay fever, right? So yeah. it's amazing just how many nails this hammer's got. You know, when you do low carb, it just seems to, because it reverses insulin resistance, you can just tick off so many things. Sometimes eczema gets better, or psoriasis will get better, Um Often people's hay fever and asthma will, if not resolved, reduce. So it's really quite a profound impact on our, you know, all these all these common diseases that GPs treat every day. You know, suddenly just can often be touched by this. And 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 you and the, here's another here's the question: What it's not part of a standard blood test? No, no, no. I was never taught to do it. In fact. I, I quite cheekily just thought, I'm just, I'm just going to throw this on and see, see what happens. You know, I'm just going to spend a, a month or two putting it onto my standard blood forms of fasting glucose, oh, sorry, fasting insulin, mm-hmm. and, and just see, see you know, what, what, what happens. And, and also, I, 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 look, I again, watched, um, read some things um, online and watched some uh, you know, learned people tell me what and why um, and constitutes normal and abnormal because a lot of the lab references are quite wrong too. What, um, what are the lab references for a fasting insulin level? What is normal? It, it varies. It depends on the lab. So okay. one lab got less than twelve, one's got less than seventeen, and one's got less than twenty-five. Wow, that's quite a range. Yeah, yeah. And, and what's really normal is less than eight, preferably around about five. Wow, that is so less than eight and uh, or less than five yeah, is ideal. Yeah. Wow, that that's a huge range in. Um, in nor- well, that's the problem, isn't it, with normal? I think people, uh, we need to remind people that what normal is is you take 100,000 tests and see what the average is and that's normal. Yeah. But if, but if 80,000 of those are unhealthy people, Correct. you've just set the normal at a Correct. really bad level. The bar exactly. has been set very low. And I think that's what's happened. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, but- Oh wow, Rob! This uh, what a what an amazing journey for you to to go on and 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 uh, to shape your practice. Um, the other part when we when we met in in Melbourne in May was your interest in regenerative agriculture, and this is something yeah. that I obviously feel very passionate about as well. Yeah. Tell me a bit about that. You know, why are you yeah, so interested? Really off on that, I think. It was huh? really- was, we, we really hit it off on that. It was really great to talk to you. And and, and uh, you, you told me about one of your heroes, um, Alan Savory, mm. uh, that night. And I, I quickly went home and watched his uh, TED Talk, mm. which I'd highly recommend people watch. Yeah. Um, yep. But you've 20... had some involvement in the community. What is it? The CA? Community? Yeah, it's, it's this thing called CSA, which CSA. is Community Supported Agriculture. Yeah. Um, 
and the, I mean, my involvement is just simply as a as a consumer. Um, so you know, if you just you know, Google CSA and put in the, the city in which you live or the area in which you live, um, then um, or community supported agriculture, you'll, you'll just come across a bunch of farms around you that supply directly to people. Now, um, that doesn't mean that they're regenerative farmers, but they often are, and um, uh, they're, they're people who are quite passionate about. Um, you can read on their websites too about what they do and see whether they use regenerative practices. And by regenerative, you know what what I mean is that they're building soil, mm. they're, they're putting carbon back into the ground and sequestering carbon. Um, you know, we talk about you know, do we have technologies for carbon sequestration? Well, hey, you know, we have cows, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have uh, we have uh, frequent rotation of of paddock. Um, uh, her, paddock, you know, herds within yeah. paddocks, and that, that's the technology that nature has used. Oh, well, it hasn't used paddocks, but it, what it's used is predators and to you know, move the, to move them around and to keep them tight. Mm. You know, and so the wild buffalo that used to, you know, the ten million or so wild buffalo that used to ro- roam the North American plains were kept very tight by the coyotes and wolves, um, and they'd completely eat out that patch of grass they were standing on. Um, they'd drop a whole lot of manure and a whole lot of urine. On that patch, and then they'd move on and not come back to it for months, if not years, because they were so tight. Mm. And in that time, that grass would go berserk. Yeah. Um, the 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 as um um was it Alan Savory? I think said the. I oh know it was actually um, Charles Massey said uh, the solar panels on the grass would would work, and uh, you know you'd, you'd uh, ph- ph- photosynthesize and put the carbon back into the ground, and that's what. Most farmers don't do, unfortunately, because instead of having a really tight paddock, they have a really open paddock with an enormous um, size. And so the grass is just constantly being nibbled on all the time, but ne- never really eaten out. And that same process doesn't happen, unfortunately, when that's happening to that grass. So the, the only real difference, or the, not the only difference, but one of the differences of regenerative farming is is um, paddock size. And, and electric fences are really great at, at um, moving on a daily or weekly or whatever basis. Um, and even though you might have the same number of cattle on the same total um, space, by keeping them really tight and moving them constantly, you build soil. Um, it's exciting because it reverses climate change. You know, it's this sort of, you know, defining um, environmental, you know, disaster of our era. And, and it's actually got a solution. Mm. I was talking to uh, Terry McCosker on, on this show um, recently, and he added another little bit of pearl of uh, knowledge, and that was: Did you know that uh, ruminant urine contains plant growth hormone? Wow! wow. <laughs> I know that's what I said. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just such an incredible system. And what I yeah. find fascinating about it is there are so many similarities between um, healthcare, holistic healthcare, and a holistic bland management and yeah. resistance to the status quo and influence of not big pharma, but big Correct. chemical. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a really interesting parallel and it's just so important for us as health practitioners, as I know, we, we got, we got, we wound each other up when we were talking <laughs> about it, <laughs> which is great. You know, I mean, I think it, I think we do need to connect. I'd like to see the coming century is the century of the revered farmer, not the revered fa- financier or lawyer right. like we had. Yeah. No, yeah. no offence to any financier or lawyer listening to this, <laughs> yeah. but the farmers. But the, are- yeah, and the beauty of community supported agriculture is that you, you as a consumer of these farming products, you can actually make that happen by supporting that regenerative yeah. farmer yeah. instead of giving your money to to a supermarket, give it directly to this person who is actually saving the planet, right, And as well as giving you really amazing food. And what usually happens is they deliver it either to your doorstep or to a, a store that you nominate nearby. You can go and pick it up once a month. Hmm. It, it works really, really well. In fact, today I'm getting my pork. I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I thought, I thought, I, thought I'd, I sensed a sense of excitement here. I thought yeah. it was it. But listen, now we've covered some great territory here, Rob, and we're coming to the end. And I just wanted to ask you this question, taking a step back from your role as, as a pra- medical practitioner, because we're, as you've shared with us, we are all on this health journey through life. What do you think the biggest challenge is for people in our modern world on their journey through life, on their health journey through life? 
Well, I guess it's sorting the wheat from the chaff, isn't it? Um, mm, that's an, a hell of an analogy to draw for a low-carb person. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but that is, it, it isn't. And, and even for, for me, um, pre-investigating all of this and pre-diagnosis, pre my own diagnosis, it, it, it was, you know, all the things that I'd read day in, day out and trying to determine what's what's real and what's and what's you know not and unfortunately now i realize that like 99 percent of what i actually read about food is wrong um yeah there was a there was a there was a story in the age um here in melbourne a few days ago that was reprinted from the washington post that rated the order of healthiness of meat and i was astounded to 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 again once again hear about not astounded but i was disappointed to hear about that red meat has you know been talked down as being unhealthy and that is bizarre because this is a natural human food. In nature, we eat red meat. What would the what would the Aboriginals have eaten? The ones that were inland that were nowhere near an ocean. Lots and lots of red meat. You know, lots of kangaroo and wallaby and whatnot. And to demonise a natural human food without any basis in science. And and this is the point. You know, I guess the average person is being told that there is good re research that red meat causes bowel cancer and all this. Stuff. And the reality is it's not. We're in the same place now with something like red meat where we were with fat in the 80s. So this is not unprecedented that we're being told quite regularly and quite um, from, you know, ostensibly respectful bodies that or respected bodies that there is a nutrient or a food which is dangerous for which there is no basis in science. You know, we were told that eggs would give us heart attacks and that fat would make us fat and give us heart attacks. And we now know that's total nonsense. Um, so it's not unprecedented for us to be told something on a regular basis that is completely wrong. Um, and that's disappointing, but um, it's the world we live in and I find it, it's, you know, it's a challenge for my patients. Um, so I kind of, you know, when I talk to my patients, I, I, I kind of need to say, look, I'm really sorry, you're going to come across all sorts of things that are going to, um, that are going to, you know, counter what I'm trying to get across to you. I like to pe ask people to just sort of suspend that and to, to not, not listen in the meantime and just see how it makes them feel. And um, the, the reality is that the path to disease is not, you know, it's not littered with feeling great. You know, if, you, if, if this diet makes you feel great, it's likely that it's healthy, right? Um, the path to disease is kind of, you know, potted with you feeling not great. Um, so, you know, I very much doubt that you're going to get a, a major disease if, if it makes you have more energy and it makes you feel vital and have better concentration, which is what low carb does. Rob, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been terrific. I've, it's, uh, we're going to have links to your low-carb clinic in Melbourne uh, and, and some of that community-supported agriculture. I think that's a great link for us to share. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ron. When health practitioners become patients, some very interesting things can happen. Challenging the accepted paradigm or status quo is one. There are many things Rob mentioned that resonated with me, but two in particular stood out. The first was our built-in desire or need to accept the status quo. Rob made the point that throughout human history, listening and learning from past experience would have been critical to our survival. What should we know about the environment in which we live? What food should we eat? What should we avoid? All these things in order to literally survive, even to this even to the point that a well-educated, well-meaning practitioner accepts the status quo, adv advising patients with the best of intentions. And as I said before on this podcast and in my book, our current healthcare system is a great economic model. It's just not a very good health model. The influence of the chemical, food and pharmaceutical industry on what constitutes the status quo in healthcare is a story that is very easy to miss, but once you become aware of it, it is very difficult to ignore. And it can, importantly, be very empowering, not just for a patient, but for a practitioner as well. The second standout for me was Rob's analogy of the glucose fat fuel model for the body being like a hybrid car, which switches throughout the journey, and in the body's case, between glucose and fat. Now, Rob defined um, 
the ideal level uh, to be below 50 grams per day um, or, or around 30 grams per day. Now, I, I must admit I've always felt that 70 grams were very sustainable, uh, but if I was a, a diabetic or pre-diabetic, I'd certainly be following Rob's advice. Um, but as he said, even when he gives patients and people that advice, they don't always want to go with it for all sorts of reasons, and that is perfectly fine. It's always better to make an informed decision in life, and this is no different. Now, we'll have links to Dr. Rob Zabo's low-carb clinic and also the CSA site, Community Supported Agriculture, another passion of mine and one that I hope I have pursued in past podcasts and will continue to do as well. Now, don't forget to leave a review on iTunes. Don't forget to download the Unstress app. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriate